Hey guys, it's Allie and I am here in the George Ranch home and I am in here in Albert and Mamie's master bedroom. And as you guys can kind of tell just by looking here at the desk, they like their cows. And so I'm here to tell you guys a little bit about cattle ranching here in Texas, but being a resident here in the state, everyone knows the king of all ranches and that's obviously the King's Ranch. So the King's Ranch is the biggest cattle ranch here in the country. It's actually 825,000 acres of land. It's bigger than the state of Rhode Island. And so how the whole King Ranch started, um, Richard King would come to Texas in the 1840s. He was born in New York in 1824. And he wanted to start his own kind of ferry business with bringing merchandise up and down the Rio Grande. But it was in the 1850s that he and his partner Gideon Lewis would kind of take a rest and they would set up a cattle camp on the banks of the Santa Gertrudis River. And he just fell so much in love with the property that the next year in 1853, he would purchase that land grant from the Mexican government and they would receive about 15,000 acres of land. Now, unfortunately the next year, um, Gideon Lewis would pass away, but Mr. King just kind of continued the whole ranching expo. So he would accumulate another 53,000 acres in that property. So ending up close to 70,000 acres by the beginning of the 1850s. So Richard King would marry his wife Henrietta and they would have a few children together. When um, Mr. King would pass away in 1885, his daughter Alice would marry a man by the name of Robert Clayburg and he would be that next generation that would take care of the King's Ranch. Now by this point in time, they were close to 100,000 acres because the ranch isn't just consisted of land just in that one area. They have land here in Houston for timber. They have land in Pennsylvania. They've got land across Texas for oil and gas. So it's just this giant expanse of land. So Kleberg was also a fan of cattle, very much like Mr. King. And so he would focus on longhorns, Brahmins, shorthorns, and Herefords. Shorthorns here are actually a breed of um, one of these, which you guys will learn about here in a bit. And so Mr. Kleberg wanted to make the ultimate beef cow. That's kind of how Texas is known with the Brangus and the Longhorn and working with that. Now the Santa Gertrudis was officially documented as a legit breed in the 1940s. And so that is a crossbreed between a Brahma and a Shorthorn. So at max weight, a Santa Gertrudis is about 22,000, about 200, um, and sorry, 2,200 pounds of just pure beef. And that became the huge height of Texas with making that perfect cow. Now, like I said, over the course of time, um, the King's Ranch family would eventually own more and more and more land. And again, ending with that 825,000 acres of land, which is just truly astounding. But branching off of the Santa Gertrudis, coming forward to where we are today, we are in the George home. That's the home of Albert and Mamie George. And it's Mamie's husband, Albert, who would actually get really into the cattle business, kind of almost competing with the King's Ranch. So if you've been on here before, you kind of know the story here at the ranch about the Jones family coming in the 1820s. But if you jump a few generations later, you get to Mamie Davis. Now, Mamie was born in 1877. She would marry her husband, Albert George, in 1896. And Mamie's grandmother, Polly, was the one who had the land grant out here. So shortly after their marriage, they decided they would want to build a house and come back out here to the property where it all started. So that next year, Mr. George would have his first official herd of um, Brahmin cattle, which is a fantastic breed from India that does very, very well with the Texas humidity and heat. And from there, he began working, again, almost in competition mode with the King's Ranch and making that perfect breed cow. Um, Mr. George also had a deep love for shorthorn cows. He actually owned one of the biggest herds of shorthorn cattle here in the country. And going off of what the King's Ranch did, he decided that he wanted to make a better improved Santa Gertrudis. So if you look at these beautiful little babies behind me, this is Mr. George's breed and they are called a Brayhorn. So again, it's a crossbreed of a Brahmin and a Shorthorn, but the genetics are just a tad different. But these guys at full weight can be about 3,200 pounds, so 3,200 pounds of walking beef. That's a lot of beef. And so they also would become their own official breed in the 40s and would be that competitor with the King's Ranch. But it was after Mrs. George's, Mr. George's death in 1955 that the breed would eventually die away. There was no one left to take care of um, the breed that he had managed. But here again, with Texas, you get the whole kind of cattle thing here. With the Georges, they actually knew a very famous individual and there is a photograph of him here and that is Gene Autry. Now, if the name rings a bell to you, he is known as the singing cowboy. He is a fantastic country singer and actor who was very prominent in the 1940s and 50s. 
He was a Texas boy born and raised on a ranch. And he would come to Texas frequently, especially Houston, to perform at the Houston Rodeo. That's how he and Mr. George would actually meet. And so because Gene Autry would do so much work at local rodeos, he was like, hey, I could be a rancher too. So he would work a lot with local ranches here in Fort Bend County. So that of the Kings Ranch and also that of the Frost Ranch. They have a few different ranches around the area where he would come up with his own breed that would be frequently used and could be sold into the rodeos. So if you ever have a chance to go to the Houston Rodeo, you guys can kind of learn more about the really awesome story of Gene Autry. Hey everybody, it's Allison Harrell, and I am just gonna pop on real quick and give you the history of a couple more ranches before we wrap this video up. The first ranch I wanna talk about is the XIT Ranch. This ranch is really interesting because of the unique way that it was started and um, sort of what happened with it. So in 1875, Texas had a real issue, and the issue was that the state capitol was in terrible shape, but they had absolutely no money to fix it or get a new one. So in 1875, they set aside 3 million acres of land in the Texas Panhandle, and they earmarked that land to be used to get a new capitol. Their original plan was to sell the land to raise the money to get the capitol, and it would work a normal way. But in 1881, that plan was put on the back burner when the state capital at the time burned to the ground. So now they needed a new capital now. They didn't have any time to sell the land, but they did have 3 million acres of earmarked land. So enter the capital syndicate. This group of people, mostly from Illinois, was created in order to take the land in exchange for building a new capital. So that's what they did. They were given the land as payment and they built the new capital. Now they were given 3, 000, 3 million acres of land and the new Capitol building cost over $3 million to build. The Capitol building is still the one we use today. It's built entirely out of red granite. It is the largest state capital in North America and the dome is seven feet taller than the dome of the United States Capitol in Washington, DC. So we got a really great capital out of this deal. Now let's talk about that Capitol syndicate. This syndicate um, didn't end up looking at the land until 1882. That's when Colonel Amos Babcock ends up going to survey all of the land. And he recommends that immediately they fence the land and they fill it with cows. The eventual goal was that next they would move to agriculture and eventually they would sell the land to use for housing. So they had a plan, now they just needed to get money to actually enact the plan. So John Farwell ends up going to England. And in England, um, he's one of the Capital Syndicate members, by the way. And in England, he ends up creating the Capital Freehold Land and Investment Company of London. So he sells bonds from this company to um, English people. And those people end up helping him raise 5 million US dollars in order to get the ranch off the ground. So in 1885, the first herd of cattle that were long of leg and long of horn arrive at the XIT ranch. And it was on the way to the ranch that the XIT name and brand was actually created. It was created by the person who was driving that first herd of longhorns. And the reason he created the XIT brand is because it's a really unique shape. Each letter is a unique shape and it's a really unique um, order of those letters because that would make it really difficult for rustlers to steal the cows, rebrand them, and then resell them with no one knowing. Rustlers were actually a really big problem for the XIT ranch the entire time it was in operation. So choosing a brand specifically to thwart rustlers really made a lot of sense. Now there is a myth that the XIT stands for 10 in Texas because the XIT ranch did cover 10 counties in the state of Texas, but the brand doesn't actually mean anything. By the turn of the century, there were 94 distinct pastures that were fenced in and over 1500 miles of fencing at the XIT ranch. But those original British investors started to grumble that their investment hadn't paid off. So they started selling land. By 1909, nearly every single British investor had their bonds paid in full. And by 1916, the last of the XIT cows was sold. And by 1963, the last of the XIT land was sold. Now, the ranch does have a claim to fame because it was the largest fenced in range in the world. So the XIT ranch was really important and it had a really important role, but a really unique story. The next ranch we have to talk about is the YO ranch. 
Now in 1880, Charles Schreiner got a half a million acres of land on the Edwards Plateau. And that's what really started his ranch. He called it the YO. And then when he died in 1914, he split the land between his eight children. His son, Walter, was given 69,000 acres of land, and he kept that ranch afloat through a pretty severe drought in the late 1910s and through the Great Depression. When he died in 1933, his widow took over, and then his son took over in the 1950s. His son is the one we've talked about a number of times, Charles Schreiner III. He is the one that decided to bring the Longhorn back from extinction. He created the Y.O. Ranch Herd, and he also created the Longhorn Cattle Breeders Association of America. So he was pretty instrumental in keeping the Longhorn afloat, but it's also interesting to find out that he kind of diversified what his ranch was offering. So rather than just raising cows and selling cows to make money, the Y.O. Ranch also started to offer hunting leases. So you could actually um, go to the ranch and hunt things like turkey and deer, originally. And then Charles Schreiner III started importing um, some African game. So he had a variety of exotic animals that were living on the ranch that you could come and hunt. So the next ranch we have to talk about is the Four Sixes. Now the Four Sixes brand is a pretty unique one and it's one that when you look at you understand why it's called the Four Sixes because there are Four Sixes. Samuel Burke Burnett uh, moved to Texas from Missouri with his parents when he was 10 years old. Nine years later, he went into business, and that's when he purchased his first 100 cows that had the Four Sixes brand on them. Now, because he purchased these cows and they had this brand, he was now the owner of that brand, so that's the brand he kept operating under. In 1873, he drove 1,100 steer to Wichita, Kansas, but he didn't end up selling them until the next year. Because he waited, he ended up being able to make $10,000 of profit from these steers. So he was pretty successful. He later negotiated with Comanche chief Quanah Parker, the son of Cynthia Ann Parker, and worked out a deal where he could graze his cows on Comanche land. He had a really deep respect for the Native Americans, and he also passed down his love of the land and his respect for the Native Americans to his descendants. So he had a deal with the Native Americans that he could use their land. And it became an issue because a lot of these deals were being revoked by the national government. So he actually had to go to Washington DC to ask the president at the time for an extension on his lease so that he could work out a different deal. So he got that extension, but shortly after that, he did purchase his first land for grazing. He purchased the Eight Ranch and the Dixon Creek Ranch, and that became the basis of the Four Sixes Ranch today. With those two purchases and a few others, he ended up with a third of a million acres of land. In 1917, he set out to build the finest ranch house in West Texas, in Guthrie, Texas. It was an 11 bedroom house that was designed by a prestigious architecture firm out of Fort Worth, Texas, and he used it to its full extent. He entertained people like President Roosevelt and Will Rogers, along with many others. He died in 1922, and his estate was actually uh, managed by a number of trustees for uh, quite a while until his great-granddaughter, Anne Marion, took over in 1980. We have one last family to cover with our ranching video, and that is the Frost family from Fort Bend County. Now, you might be wondering why we're not talking about the Moore family today, but they're going to get their own video just about them and all the things they've done, so we're just going to skip over them today and just talk about the Frosts. In the 1940s, three different Frosts were all operating separate ranches in Fort Bend County that had one thing in common, the Brahmin. This species of cow was brought to the United States in 1885 and became a favorite of the Fort Bend County ranchers in the 1940s. This cow has a high tolerance for heat, sunlight, and humidity, all things that Fort Bend County has in spades. The three operations in question were being run by Milo Frost, Vernon Frost, and Clarence Pete Frost. Milo had purchased land from Sugarland Industries in the 1940s, and he ran a successful Brahmin operation from there. While he was doing this, he was also the president of the American Brahmin Breeders Association. When he stopped being in the cattle business, he ended up selling his remaining stock to A.P. George, and the land today is now part of the First Colony Subdivision. Vernon Frost purchased the Pecan Acres Ranch in Symington in 1945, and on his 1,000 acres, he had 7,500 pecan trees and um, award-winning cattle for sale on the international market. The last Frost to mention is Clarence Pete Frost, who ran the Figure 4 Ranch. This ranch was internationally known for its Brahmin and other cattle breeding operations. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed our video all about ranching, and I hope you learned something about um, the different ranches across Texas.